Keeping his promise, Donald Trump reimposes economic and trade sanctions on Iran despite global condemnation. The measures are meant to impede Tehran's ability to sell oil on the world market. But could U.S. pressure on the regime end up hurting the Iranian people the most? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. It had all the makings of a Hollywood thriller. The U.S. president teasing his 55 million Twitter followers about sanctions on Iran. But Donald Trump's taunt was not a joke, and it's expected that there will be real-life consequences for millions of Iranians. Strict economic and trade penalties come into effect on Monday. The White House says the aim is to force Iran to abandon what it calls its destructive behavior in the Middle East. Russia, China, and many European allies have strongly criticized the move. There's plenty to discuss with our guests. First, though, Patty Cohane has the latest from Washington, D.C. It's probably fair to say U.S. foreign policy has never been announced like this. But this is an actual tweet from the U.S. president, meant to look like a movie poster, warning that sanctions are coming. And the president later addressed that on the South Lawn. Sanctions are starting on Iran, and... You know, Iran is taking a very big hit. His top aides, including Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, talking tough as well on a conference call with reporters. The Treasury Department will add more than 700 names to our list of blocked entities. This includes hundreds of targets previously granted sanctions relief under the JCPOA, as well as more than 300 new designations. This is substantially more than we ever have previously done. But they are giving waivers to eight countries, allowing them to continue to buy Iranian oil, with the promise they will reduce that amount over time. The U.S. is breaking the international deal, and the rest of the signatories say they want to stay in it. Proponents of the nuclear deal say this move will isolate the U.S. Russia was abiding by it, the Chinese were abiding by it, the Europeans were abiding by it. And most importantly, the Iranians were abiding by it. It's now the United States that is in breach of that agreement and is now actually going so far as to punish countries that are abiding by a UN Security Council resolution. You really can't get more pariah than that. The European Union created what they hope will be a workaround to still do business in Iran. U.S. officials are brushing off its potential, but are warning allies they could face sanctions as well. Right now, talking tough, while the world waits to see if it will be more than words. Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. Now to the panel. Joining us via Skype from Paris, Francois Nicolot, the former French ambassador to Iran. In Tehran, Mohamed Islami, a political researcher and columnist. And in St. Andrews, Scotland, also via Skype, Drew Lickerman, the vice chairman for Republicans Overseas UK. Welcome to all of you. I'm going to start with the uh, first question to all of you. Um, Francois, first, is, the, is this nuclear deal flawed? No, the nuclear deal still goes on. Huh? We, we still have uh, uh, five and uh, five countries uh, um, abiding uh, by the deal, uh, and of course Iran also is abiding by the deal. Of course, uh, it's like an animal walking on three legs. You know, it's a bit difficult to make it walk, but up to now the deal uh, goes on. No, and no, no. What I... is interesting. Yes. Well, I guess what I'm asking, though, is there do you think that some of the criticisms of the deal, particularly from the Trump administration, do you think that some of them are legitimate? Criticism of the deal. You know, the, 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 the main defect of the deal in the eyes of Donald Trump is that the deal was concluded by uh, by Barack Obama. Huh? And this is why, in fact, it, it, it is the worst deal ever concluded by the United States. I mean, um, Trump is trying to destroy, I mean, all the heritage left uh, behind him by Obama. And, of course, uh, the, um, the, the nuclear deal with Iran was the, the, the most accomplished f feature uh, in, uh, in uh, external policy that uh, 
put together by the, uh, by, the, by the American administration. And of course, to destroy it, it is very, to try to destroy it is very symbolic for, for Donald Trump. Now, will it succeed? This is another question, but I leave the debate open. Okay, and we will come back to that question. In fact, um, Mohammed, let me put the same question to you. Do you think that some of the criticisms of the, the Iran nuclear deal are, are fair? I think that uh, as IAEA, International Atomic Agency, and also the European Union, and also the European, uh, I mean, the United Nations Security Council, all of these uh, said that Iran was committed to the deal and committed to its promises. So the deal is going on, and Iran is committed to its promises. Uh, so we are waiting for the Trump administration to come back to the negotiating table. All the partners of this international deal are still around the negotiating table, but the Trump administra administration uh, left the negotiations and left the deal. So we are going to wait for them to discover what the Obama administration discovered before, that the sanctions would not help to make peace. OK. Um... Drew, let me ask you, do you think that the Trump administration has actually articulated what they think is wrong with the deal, besides, as Francois was saying, just that it was something that happened under the Obama administration? Do you think that, he, that they have actually articulated what they don't like about the deal? Uh, yes, they have multiple times. Uh, multiple people in the Trump administration have. Some of the top disagreements being the sunset clause that Iran could start enriching uranium, in about eight years, um, in about 10 years, when all the 10 to 15 years, when all the sanctions are lifted, it will be impossible uh, to sanction Iran again if they try to break out and build a nuclear weapon. This deal does not stop uh, ballistic missile proliferation in Iran. This deal does not stop Iran's financing of terror from the Houthis in Yemen to Hezbollah um, to their actions with the Assad regime. So the Trump administration actually has laid out all of their concerns with the deal. Um, when Trump first came into office, he gave our European partners, uh, I think it was, was it eight months or 12 months? Um, he said, we have this amount of time. I want to see what we can do to fix the deal, what can be made done. Europe didn't offer any alternatives. Nothing moved forward. And like Trump said, he said, in 12 months, we're going to leave the deal if, uh, if nothing changes. Nothing changed and Trump stuck to his word. So I think, so yes, the Trump... I'm sorry. So a lot of those criticisms that you have that you have of of the regime in Iran and that Donald Trump does, people have the same um, concerns about Saudi Arabia. Why the different policies? Right. Uh, look, there's a lot of concerns about actors and what's going on in the region, but these are two very very separate issues. Um, look, How the, so? part of the reason. Well, first of all, the only reason why the Assad regime is still fighting is because of Iranian support, Hezbollah in Lebanon, which Iran has bankrolled, Iran bankrolled. The war in the Yemen is going Yemen. on because of Saudi Arabia. And terror groups all across, uh, terror groups, Hezbollah running essentially the drug and human trafficking trade across Europe, bankrolled by Iran. Iranian money is uh, much more detrimental to the region. And look, I think but my the question, US should, though, my I question though is, should, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be yeah, an either yeah. or, though, is what I'm asking. I, I'm not saying that 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 some of the criticisms that you have uh, against Iran are not things that many analysts agree with. I, I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying why the different policies, why the either or, is what I'm asking. Well, look, I, th I think that the U.S. does. We we do need to evaluate, especially what happened with Jamal Khashoggi in, in Turkey. It was a very deplorable action. I think. Some of these things do need to be looked into. Um, look, in the same breath, all across the region, we have allies and enemies which have which have committed terrible acts. For instance, um, look, with Jamal Khashoggi, with most recently with uh, Qatar being accused of using um, Jamal Ben Omar for hacking Americans and using diplomatic immunity to try to get out of it. Uh, look, these are all, th and the U.S. having a military base there. I think these are all things the U.S. should reevaluate, should look at. But I think at the end of the day, Iran is the leading state sponsor of terrorism. And I think cracking down on the Iranian regime and cracking down on nefarious behavior is something that is very important. It's something the Iran deal overlooked and something it very easily Mohammed, you, uh, could have dealt with. Mohammed, you are in Tehran. I assume you would like to respond to that. Uh, 
Um, you know, it is crystal clear for everyone in the world that Trump does not respect international agreements, does not respect international terms, and he's as a businessman, he wants to be focused on the trade with Saudis and the huge investment by Saudi family in the circle around the president and his family. So they don't want to react to what Saudis are doing in Yemen. And it is interesting for me that they've killed an American journalist, an American citizen in a consulate, in their consulate in Turkey. And they, and nothing happened for them, you know? So um, it is Trump not respecting to international agreements, not respecting to Paris Agreement, NAFTA, or something like this. And so I don't think that they would be succeed in their new um, policy, that new policy, new decision to reimposing sanctions on Iranian people, you know? Francois, let me, let me ask you about that. What about the credibility of the United States that, you know, the Trump administration has ripped up this deal that took several countries a very long time to come to. And also, let's go back to that meme that he tweeted that said sanctions are coming. Do, do you think that that reflects a real um, understanding the gravity of what this is? Listen, um, before addressing this point, I would like to go a little backwards. Sure. And, uh, concerning the, the, the criticism about the agreement. It has been often said by the, by the, um, the Trump administration that uh, after the sunset closes of the agreement, you know, in uh, uh, 10 to 15 years and even a little less, uh, Iran would be free to do uh, what uh, it wants. It would be free to, to build up a, a nuclear arsenal. This is not true <clears throat> because the... In fact, the safeguards of the of the Vienna agency, you know, which controls um, all uh, um, peaceful, in principle, peaceful activities uh, in the nuclear field around the world. I mean, the safeguards will continue uh, to to apply on Iran. Iran will have to to accept inspe inspectors. Iran will still be bound by its uh, signature of um, the non-proliferation treaty, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And so Iran is not free. And this, is, this has to be quite clear. Even after the, the end of the agreement, Iran will not be free to do what uh, it would like to do. Uh, the, if it uh, wants to, to build a bomb, it will be, again, it's, uh, uh, let's say, the international law applying to Iran. So. Uh, in fact, the, the main uh, criticism, uh, one of the main criticism uh, against this uh, agreement was the fact that it is limited to, to, to the nuclear affairs and to the nuclear field. But one has to consider that uh, uh, the question was already very complex. If the negotiators in, the, in, um, in 2012, from 2012, from 2015, had tried to negotiate about everything, about the role of Iran in the region, um, about uh, its uh, ballistic program, there would have been no agreement. So, so the, the, in fact, uh, the, the choice was made to limit the negotiation to the nuclear field, hoping that a, a good implementation of this agreement would open avenues okay, so let me, go towards... Uh, yes? Let me bring Drew into that, because, Drew, what about that, that um, perhaps it would it have been better to keep the current agreement and then try to build upon it? Because at the very least, you would still have inspectors as opposed to ripping it up and, and trying to start over when the sides are just going to be that less trusting of each other. Well, no, because the deal is flawed far beyond that. Um, the, the last panelist spoke about inspections, which, yeah, inspections are great, but under the current framework, I believe it's uh, just slightly over three weeks that the um, International Atomic Agency has to give notice before an inspection. I mean, that, that's ridiculous to give three weeks head notice before an inspection. Uh, and the point about destroying U.S. credibility by pulling out of the deal um, I mean, frankly, that's that's a bit insulting when this entire deal was written around getting around written around um, 
getting around the U.S. Senate. In the U.S., to pass a treaty, it has to go through the Senate. They used particular wording in this treaty because they knew the U.S. Senate would not support the Iran deal. They used particular wording that only Obama was needed uh, to sign off the deal. And because of that, Trump was able to walk away from the deal without Senate Okay, approval. Drew, to be, this... to be specific, to be specific, the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act of 2015 actually allowed Congress to have some say-so in this. Had they chose to, they didn't because they didn't have the votes to reject it. That's actually not true. You're talking about the Corker Cardin bill. Uh, yeah, I am. Which made... Which, which made the threshold 60 votes. It should be two thirds, and it's because it wasn't a treaty. Uh, Senate Democrats, they allowed it, yes, they allowed it to go to a 60 threshold vote. But if the deal used the actual word treaty, that's and it was fair. a treaty, I, that, that's... the Senate would have needed two thirds of the vote. The deal was written specifically to get around um, having to have Congress verify the bill. And that's but, why Trump was able to pull out of it without without Senate approval. Understood. Absolutely. It's completely w within his purview to withdraw. Absolutely. But I'm still asking the question, the fact that it still is U.S., the U.S. word that was on the line, and, and now that's been ripped up. Do you think that that makes it more difficult for people to trust the U.S. going forward is what I'm asking? Um, well, look, I, I, I very well can see that argument, um, the U.S. pulling out of the deal, but I think, I think we've articulated very well why we're pulling out of the deal. We articulated our concerns very well, and we gave our European counterparts and our Iranian counterparts um, about a year's notice to try to come back and work on the deal, fix the deal. It was just pushed around, kicked down the road, nothing happened, and, and Trump stuck to his word. He, he did uh, he didn't rip up the uh, rip up the deal right when he came into office. He did give it a year, like he said, uh, to come back and fix things. Nothing happened. So, look, I think we're going to have to start again with new negotiations, a new deal. I think everyone wants to see a deal, but at the same time, um, I personally, I know a lot of people are under the impression that a bad deal is worse than no deal at all. I want to talk about the politics of it and and just sit tight, Mohammed, because I do want to talk about the politics of it um, in Iran in just a moment. But I do want to put one more question to Drew since you brought up the politics of it in Congress, which is which is totally fair. We don't know what's going to happen with the midterms in the U.S. on Tuesday. The the Dems, may, the Democrats, sorry, I mean to use the slang there, um, the Democrats, uh, they get a little bit of power. How difficult do you think that this can make it going forward as, as the Trump administration tries to negotiate a new deal? Right. I think that's, yeah, it's a very good and interesting point to bring up. Um, yeah, the, the Iran deal is, look, the vast majority of Republicans oppose it and the vast majority of Democrats support it. But at the same time, um, it's actually, it's one of those things that there's a lot of people that are cross party on it. There's quite a few prominent Republicans. Um, I guess now maybe they change their view a bit, but at the time we're more pro Iran deal. And there's a lot of prominent Democrats like Chuck Schumer, the Democrat, uh, leader of the Democrats, uh, Senator Menendez, Senator, uh, uh, Senator Cardin in Maryland. There are a lot of Democrats who, um, who didn't actually support the deal. They didn't support Trump pulling out, but the Iran deal, it's one of those interesting things in the U.S. where, um, yeah, the, the it mostly is down party lines, but mm -hmm. really there are a lot of people that go cross party. So it's it's going to be very hard to tell how that changes. Very. It's it's going to be a lot of who's the leader of what committee now in the very, House and the Senate. Very, very true. Um, Mohammed, what does this mean for internal Iranian politics? Because these sanctions, as we all know, really end up hurting the average Iranian who is just trying to feed their family because prices end up going up. So what does this mean for internal politics in Iran? Uh, first of all, let me mention Trump's tweets and sanctions are coming. You know, there was a joke today in, uh, I heard in, in um, Tehran that people are saying that instead of these kind of sentences, he should say something, quotes from Matt King in the HBO's Game of Thrones. So, uh, Game of Thrones. So, people in Iran uh, are waiting for bad days, yeah, because, because these sanctions would be would put pressure on the ordinary people, especially in terms of humanitarian uh, aspects, you know, that uh, access to the medicine and to many fields of healthcare would be really hard after uh, we imposing the sanctions. I mean, and Trump administration always say that they don't want to put sanctions on these kind of fields, but uh, to be honest, uh, they are going to threatening all international uh, transferring system not to work with Iran. So 
they indirectly they are putting sanctions on even the humanitarian aspects of Iranian daily day life and this is and these kind of sanctions is silent killing. So in terms of internal politics there was a debate in Iran. Some said that um, negotiation and uh, have some kind of compromise with the international system would help the Iranian to have better life but now because of the Trump, because of the Trump administration, they are, it is really hard to, in Iran to uh, continue to say that the diplomacy would work. Okay. Um, Francois, what does this mean for other countries that still want to deal with Iran, particularly European countries, U.S. allies? What does this mean for them? Because they have been very clear that, that they don't want to go, as they perceive, go backwards. Well, of course, uh, um, it, everything will be more difficult huh? uh, for European countries, for even for China, even for Russia. But um, they all hope to maintain a, a kind of flux of uh, at least current trade between Iran and, uh, and themselves. And um, they're trying to put together instruments to be able to, to circumvent the the use of the dollar, which is a, a great problem with, uh, with uh, of course, because using the dollar uh, automatically uh, opens uh, a case uh, for applying the sanctions. And uh, But uh, will it work? Nobody knows exactly. But and another point uh, is that Iran itself is going to develop, I mean, to, to, to put again to use all the ways uh, it has already used in the past huh, to circumvent the sanctions huh, uh, through uh, more or less shady deals, uh, uh, transfers of oil, you know, changing the, the, the flag, which is uh, on the, the, the flag put on oil. I mean, the Iranian oil will suddenly uh, be transferred to to other tankers, and uh, it will disappear as Iranian oil. It will, it will be sold as Omani oil, perhaps, or I don't know what, perhaps Russian oil, etc. Okay. And of course, uh, the population will suffer, but uh, first, a little group of people will certainly, in Iran, uh, people well introduced uh, um, to the leadership, will certainly make money out of these uh, shady deals. And remains the big question, or in spite of the suffering of the people, will the, re the regime uh, 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 will the regime crumble down, or will it uh, abide by all the, the demands, uh, so uh, the, the American demands? This is r really doubtful, because the, this, uh, the Iranian France. regime uh, is used to uh, to resist. I mean, to external okay, Francois, pressure, just a minute, just... and also to its internal pressure. I'll okay. Stop there. Okay. I want to. Uh, we're, we're we're really tight on time, but Drew, I want to give you the last word. What about what Francois is saying that Iran has weathered this before? Um, what motivation do they have to to come back to the table? Do you think something will actually get done? Yeah, look, I hope something will get done. And the point about sanctions hurting the average person, yeah, I feel for that. And we have, you know, Americans have nothing against the Iranian people. If anything, we, you know, a mutual respect with the Iranian people. The end goal is, you know, the IRGC and the Iranian military is so tied into so much business. And um, look, the, the sanctions would be lifted immediately if, if Iran did come back to the table and a, a, an effective and new deal was agreed upon, a longer term deal, and that would relieve sanctions in the region. It would open up Iran. Um, and look, that's the best case scenario. Our goal isn't to punish the average Iranian person. And that will be the last word. Gentlemen, thank you so much for the, for the conversation. We appreciate it. Thanks to all of our guests, uh, Francois, Nicolo, Mohammed, Eslami, and Drew Lickerman. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime. Just go to our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.